to shut down the campus. Um, we were selectively asking faculty to come in to procure their materials so that they could go out and teach the students remotely. Well, therein lies a problem. We had one person who actually went into our uh, Center for Innovation building, which is where the faculty offices are at, and unbeknownst to her, she actually tested positive the next day. So with all that being said, every place that she walked through, her office going into the adjacent um, education building, all of those surfaces had to be addressed via, via the uh, cleaning protocols. Uh, plan had to be turned in to the LA County Department of Public Health. It was a monumental task. And our purchasing department was calling around, you know, they were getting prices and some of them, honest to God, some of them were over $200,000 in order to do the cleaning protocol. It was absolutely enormous. And uh, long story short, by the time I found out about it, I actually got the information from the vice president and I asked them to procure a map and show me exactly where the instructor went through. And with all that being said, I made a phone call because I know that the uh, cleaning protocols and everything is one of the sectors of business that Kaya addresses. So I made a phone call over there and they actually procured the work and had folks out there working on the weekend, believe it or not, with only a couple days notice. You cannot ask for better customer service than that. Um, they went through the entire process and what that did for us, not to mention the fact that the price was much, much better than what the other vendors were coming back at, but what it did for us is it made it available for the other faculty members to come in and procure their equipment that they needed so that the students could carry on with their learning abilities and everything. Had that not occurred, it would have been a monumental problem because the semester, all the instruction would have been stalled. And as we all know, you do not want to do that, especially when our business is education. And for us, the client is the student and the student is number one. So with all that being said, Kaya came to our rescue. Um, they cleaned up everything top notch. And with all that being said, I've done my bragging and I have to turn it over to Lynn. She's an expert on the subject matter. And Lynn, I'm going to turn it over to you. The seminar is yours. Sure. Thank you, Fred. I appreciate it. And I think you all can see my screen now. Yeah. So this is a crazy era that we live in. Um, and obviously, as all of us are dealing with our new normal, it's important to um, try and become educated as to what that looks like based on the knowledge that we have up to this point so far, especially about COVID-19. So where I like to start off is the very basics, and that's to know the difference between cleaning, disinfecting, sterilizing, and sanitizing, because I think we tend to use those words synonymously, but they mean very different things. So for anyone um, that is public facing, let's just go through and define what that is. So cleaning removes dust, debris, and dirt from a surface by scrubbing, washing, and rinsing. Um, this is the most basic form. We're all accustomed to a standard mop and bucket clean, if you will. And uh, you'll wanna do this regardless before you put on any application of a disinfectant to a surface. So no matter what your process is gonna be, cleaning the surface should be step number one. Disinfecting destroys or inactivates both the bacteria and viruses identified on the product's label. So depending on the chemistries you choose, it will have that verbiage uh, referring to the level of destruction and ability to inactivate. Some are only labeled and listed for mold, bacteria, and do not specifically involve viruses or have only specific types of viruses. So I always say, check the labels of the um, solutions and chemistries that you're gonna move forward with and just make sure it covers all the bases that you need it to cover. So for disinfecting, um, also on the label will be defined whether it is okay to be on porous surfaces or non-porous surfaces, and we'll dive a little bit more into that a little bit later. So sanitizing, 
we're used to it. Hand sanitizer right now, I'm sure all of us have little sanitizers everywhere in our life, in the car, et cetera. Sanitizing reduces the amount of bacteria or virus identified according to the product's label and on the surface that it's applied to. So when you think about sanitizer, it's not as robust as disinfecting. Um, it's more like taking, if we're at 100% before we use it, it'll knock it down to a lower level. Um, and depending on its concentration or what the hand sanitizer is made of, it'll dictate what, what it's able to bring it down into safer levels. Disinfecting is a complete eradication, if that makes sense. And then the last one is sterilizing. I always advise people, unless we're in the medical field, let's just eradicate this from our vocabulary. Sterilizing is extremely difficult to succeed at unless you're in a clean room with individualized um, air intake and outtake, unless it's a syringe or something that's gone straight from manufacturing through a disinfectant and directly into its closed packaging, then that can be considered sterilized, which, you know, we all see the doctors peel open and pull stuff out. Those are sterilized items. But to make a space sterile is really difficult. Okay, so I just like to jump in a little bit um, to this UCSF study that was done this spring specifically about COVID-19 or COVID-2 as they refer to it in the science industry. And they found some pretty in interesting results in terms of how long the virus persists on different surfaces, hard surfaces versus aerosols. So for hard surfaces, if you look at the graph, you'll see that for SARS-CoV-2, which is our COVID-19, that the half-life they're finding on hard surfaces um, in this particular study is about seven hours. So after a surface has been exposed and it looks like they, this is specifically referring to stainless steel, uh, it takes about seven hours for the virus cells of exposure for half of them to die off and only have half left. So that's a good thing to note when you're dealing with a potential contamination. Um, kind of the rule of thumb that the industry has decided these days is that because these life spans vary depending on the material that is exposed to the virus, um, that just give it a full 24 hours if you can with it just being completely quarantined off, don't let anyone enter or exit to give that half-life an opportunity to kill off as much as the virus as possible before going in to do a complete cleaning and, and disinfection. Um, the other good thing is that so far what they've been able to tell is when COVID-2 is persisted in aerosols, which is happens all the time, the breath that comes out of our mouth when we cough, when we sneeze, any sputum um, that sprays, that it doesn't have that long of a half-life while it is airborne. Once it lands on a surface, then it's able to replicate. But at least while it's in the air, um, its half-life is pretty short, which is encouraging. So this is just a summary uh, over time, like we were discussing about the stainless steel half-life. They're using an example of six hours just to help explain how half-life works. Um, which means after 24 hours, if we're going based off of that six to seven hour timeline, we discussed 6.25% of the virus upon exposure will be remaining, which is much safer to deal with when needing to disinfect an area. So then they went ahead and tested a few other surfaces in terms of half-life. Um, the funny thing is that porous materials actually make it a lot more difficult for the virus to replicate. So you'll notice on cardboard and even as we get into um, a few slides later on, paper is really difficult for it to continue to replicate on clothing material like cotton shirts and things like that, which is good news. Although those are harder items to clean and disinfect, at at least the virus replicating is a lot lower than the harder surfaces like plastic, stainless steel, or um, any sealed, you know, epoxy, etc. 
So then this is where in this study by UCSF, they kind of compared some humidity levels. They added another variable into their testing parameters. And the interesting thing is that CoV-2, they seem to replicate um, and more and die slower in a higher humidity environment. So if you're dealing with a locker room um, or public showers, maybe at the YMCA or things like that, anything that's a higher humidity level is going to sustain the life of those virus cells longer than it would in an arid environment. So we always talk about reactive versus proactive. We'll go into proactive at the end um, because I think right now all of us are kind of dealing with the reactionary uh, reality of day to day. And uh, I'll share with you guys what we do at Kaya in terms of our proactive protocols. But for the sake of reactionary items, the first thing is soap works really well. And the reason it works well is because it's a physical disruptor. So when we're using these disinfectants, one thing to think about as you're choosing your chemistries is some are more prone to supporting a uh, potential for mutation in an environment with the virus cells, um, as opposed to physical disruptors, which do not support a mutation, which is why a lot of um, places will say, in certain situations, it's better to use standard soap as opposed to antibacterial soap if it's gonna be in an environment where there's constant exposure to the same bacteria. They don't want to encourage that mutation scenario. So they keep it to just a standard physical disruptor, which as you can see by the diagram, that's how soap works. It ruptures the membrane encasing the virus cell and forces it to kind of explode its guts everywhere. And then the other cool thing that soap does is it naturally encapsulates those fragments that have exploded everywhere and uh, kind of wraps it into what they call a micelle. And then that micelle can be washed away pretty readily, encapsulated in that protective soap coating. So in terms of disinfectants, they work by destroying the cell wall, um, mostly by interfering with their metabolism. But there are some disinfectants out there that have a physical disruption, just like soap. So just something to keep in mind, if you're not, like hospitals, they have a really hard time in terms of the disinfectants that they can use because of uh, how much exposure they have constantly to the same types of virus and bacteria. They have a lot more likelihood of causing a mutation environment um, than say our household. You know, our household, how often do we use disinfectants? Probably no more than once or twice a day, um, if that. So it's a lot less likely to have that problem. And then, of course, as we discussed before, you want to make sure that any surface before you disinfect is well cleaned because regardless of what process you use, if there's any physical barrier there, um, you're only disinfecting the top portion of that barrier. So then if you happen to wipe it off, anything that was underneath that dirt or grime or schmutz is not getting that disinfectant applied to it. And of course, motility leads to efficacy if you wanna be scientific. So in terms of disinfectants that are out there, what are we dealing with? What are we talking about? 72% um, are pretty commodity driven. They're very similar. They have similar, similar chemistries. They've been around a really long time. Uh, most of us are pretty familiar with the standards, Clorox wipes, et cetera. That would be an example of a commodity disinfectant, but there are more specialty disinfectants being designed. And the cool thing about that is that if you have a really fantastic facility and say you're concerned about the upholstery on your auditorium seating, or you have a really great lounge um, cafe area that you're going to be able to reopen to 25%, but you're worried about the discoloration from disinfectants. Um, as you choose your chemistry, those specialty disinfectants are the ones that have been designed to handle those types of issues that you may or may not be dealing with in your environment 
whether it's uh, your business or education or elsewhere. So some of the common market options are quaternary ammonium, hydrogen peroxide, probiotic, and botanical. There's a lot more to choose from than this. Um, there's also some silver base that we'll, we'll go into in a minute. But in terms of quaternary ammonium, it's probably the most common version of a disinfectant. It's pretty broad spectrum use. Um, it works really well with additional detergents. If you wanna try and clean and disinfect as a combo, if you have areas that don't get really grimy and you kind of want a two for one, it works really well with detergents, doesn't create any inactive agents. It's a lot lower odor, so you don't have to aerate the room as much um, after use or if you need people to get in there pretty quickly, that's a good option. Um, it ha it's pretty stable, good stability, especially shelf life. And on average, usually quaternary ammonium is about a 10 minute dwell time if you want full efficacy for um, the kill percentage rate and ratio um, against the virus specifically. Bacteria is a little bit easier to kill. So usually bacteria has a shorter, a shorter um, motility um, timeline. So then hydrogen peroxide, it's a really fast dwell time which is a great benefit for certain applications, average of about three minutes, but it is a fast oxidizer. I'm sure we all back in the day tried bleaching our hair with some lemon juice and peroxide. So it can definitely oxidize steel, um, some ferrous metals, and it also possibly could cause discoloration. So depending on what you might use a hydrogen peroxide based disinfectant, just make sure you test a spot in an inconspicuous area to see if you have any discoloration problems, but it's really fast at what it does. And then the probiotic um, is basically fermented bacteria and essential oils in combination. And I know that doesn't sound like it would do much of anything, but it works really well on strains of uh, resistant bacteria because it's kind of itself fighting itself in a way, um, and it leaves the good bacteria behind. So if you're not as concerned about the viral side of things, but let's say you're dealing a lot with mildew problems, or you have a uh, maybe a dojo that deals with staph and MRSA a lot, maybe a probiotic would be a really good option um, for you because it also has a little bit longer of an active timeline in terms of it keeps working beyond its motility timeline. And then botanical. This is kind of new. Um, the botanical options have been around for a few years, but they're really starting to gain traction now with COVID-19. They're made from thyme typically um, and a few other plant extracts. The nice thing is that there's no human or animal toxicity. So I know a lot of animal rescue places and things like that are utilizing the botanical disinfectants. They do have a reasonably fast dwell time. They're kind of in the middle between the hydrogen peroxide and the ammonia, uh, or the aluminum, sorry. Um, and no rinsing is required. So on some other disinfectants, if they're gonna be in a food prep area, you're gonna wanna make sure that once it's had its dwell time, you go ahead and rinse it off or uh, damp wipe it off with, you know, a wet, some wet paper towels or things like that to make sure that the residue is minimized if you're gonna food prep afterward. So then some other options, these are the disruptive coatings. So there's silver-based disruptive coatings and forgive my pronunciation, but triclosan-based uh, disruptive coatings, and then silane-based disruptive coatings. So the differences between them, as you can see in the chart that's on the screen, is um, kind of comparing the mode of action, the durability, how uh, expensive they are, um, how adaptive the organisms can become to this specific type of coating, and if there's any type of harmful um, exposure to the user 
or to the person that's going to be applying it. So I'm going to focus mostly on the silane base, and the reason is because, as you can see in the photograph underneath, the silane is um, carbon-based, and it's basically utilizing covalent bonds to create these vertical sphere-like structures. Um, and they have gotten it to be rigid enough that it will pierce the membrane of the bacteria and the virus that it comes in contact with, making it really difficult for them to replicate and hopefully making them explode just like the soap does so that they die off um, and can be cleaned afterward. But the interesting thing is that these spikes can also maintain some version of flexibility so that they actually have a pretty long lifespan. I have seen some that are for 30 days, they continue working. Now, obviously the efficacy goes down over time. So when you first apply a disruptive coating, it's gonna work really well. And as it gets reintroduced with bacteria and virus, it'll continue to kill them off. And then, you know, fast forward a week, a little bit less, one or two weeks after that, even significantly less, where it's still killing stuff off. It's just not as efficient at this point. Maybe some of those rods have begun to bend or break off, et cetera, as it comes into contact with those cells. But there are some manufacturers that are claiming if they professionally apply it, that you can get between six months to a year of continued kill rate. Um, and they have an entire mathematical ratio that gives you the timelines. There's even um, little readers that you can do swab, quick swab tests to see how much growth is coming back onto your surface. The only bummer about those swab tests is that it can't differentiate between bacteria, mold, mildew, or virus. It's just a generalized protein that is given off by all of these things when they explode on that surface. So it'll just be a generalized growth um, that can't isolate the virus specifically, unfortunately, but still, still a good monitoring system. So just a summary, as we stand the viability on different surfaces for um, COVID-19 versus SARS, and the regular flu just kind of gives you a breakdown, porous versus non-porous, um, and then hard non-porous such as stainless steel in terms of timelines, which is why, as you can see, we kind of just say, for safety's sake, give it 24 hours before you go in and try and disinfect. If you can give it 72 where you know that the half-life is almost down to zero at that point, then that's obviously the best case scenario, but a lot of us can't wait that long. We can't shut down a portion of our business for three days. So these are the typical industry applicators. Um, they each have pros and cons. Uh, I know Fred has his opinions of which are best, but I always like to tell people, do a site assessment, try and figure out what your specific needs are, um, how large your spaces are. If you have a big gymnasium, let's say you're a YMCA, you might like to use the airless sprayer because it has a really large output that's pressurized. Um, and it's just, it's, it's basically like a paint sprayer, but it's had an adaptive nozzle put onto it to make it um, adaptable to work with the disinfectant solution instead of paint because that viscosity is going to be a little different. But the airless sprayer is good for really large areas. Um, it comes out with a little too much pressure if you're working in close quarters. You definitely, it works similarly like a pressure washer. So, you know, you're not going to want to bring a pressure washer into an office and take off delaminate your desk by accident or, you know, scuff up anything or cause any damage. Um, the foaming applicator, for example, would be really good if you're a dojo that does martial arts and you have those mats and pads on the wall. And so it's difficult to get um, straight disinfectant fluid to stay on there long enough in order to get that kill ratio 
that you want in terms of timeline. So, you know, if you have to meet a 10 minute dwell time, how do you get moisture to dwell on a vertical surface for 10 minutes? So maybe this is a good applicator uh, and you have disinfectant chemistry specifically for the foam application so that it stays on those vertical surfaces. But other than that, I wouldn't recommend a foam applicator. It's really slow, it's very cumbersome, it can get really messy. Um, so it's kind of a specialized applicator. The electrostatic sprayer is probably one of the most common. Um, it's what we tend to use at our facility. I know it's what Fred uses at their facility at Citrus College. The benefit to the electrostatic sprayer, as long as you choose a disinfectant solution that is adaptable and designed to be used with an electrostatic sprayer, is that it creates um, a molecular positive and negative charge so that even if you have a computer sitting on a desk, let's say, or some papers on the surface of a desk, because of the process through the electrostatic sprayer, um everything will be attracted even underneath the computer or underneath the papers so to us it's a direct touch but if you go down to a molecular level there is always going to be a gap between those items and their surfaces and so the electrostatic sprayer allows the disinfectant to really get in that gap because it's being attracted from a molecular standpoint not just uh, using gravity to have it fall onto or on top of a surface. It'll get underneath a surface, it'll get in between the nooks and crannies, which is why if you use an electrostatic sprayer, you definitely need to have full um, protective gear. Make sure you have a suit on with a, um, a mask and full goggles. I would recommend a respirator because it sticks so well in and around all the objects you're spraying it on. What do you think it's gonna do down your throat, into your lungs? It's gonna to stick to everything also. Our bodies will work as though we're a computer. <laughs> we'll also attract the, the disinfectant. So just make sure you have a respirator on, goggles, gloves, and full PPE gear um, to use the electrostatic sprayer to keep your uh, appliers safe. And then of course we have the pump sprayer, which is, um, very, very common. I would say a lot of people utilize the pump sprayer. Oftentimes we have it for our outdoor greenery use. Obviously, if you're using um, pesticides in it, maybe don't repurpose it for disinfectant. Um, maybe just when you stock up for new containers, order a few extra that you can designate and assign to disinfectant only. But they work great. They wear like a backpack. Um, the electrostatic sprayer can also be worn like a backpack, but the pump sprayer is kind of in the control of the person doing the application and the pumping. Um, the only thing I will advise is that it does tend to expel larger size droplets, so you will get more of a moist surface. You'll see a lot more moisture falling on things, so it might not be the best application if you have a lot of sensitive electronics in the room. You might want to move to an electrostatic sprayer for um, something like that. Okay, <laughs> so the process, the process that we all know so well and is cumbersome to follow but necessary. So when you're going to disinfect a surface, no matter what it is, make sure that it is cleaned off. If that means blow off the debris, vacuum things up, wipe it down. Um, if you need to pressure wash it, if there's growth on it, if there's lichen or mold or mildew growing, you wanna try and get that off prior to cleaning and then applying your disinfectant. The better job you do of prepping the surface and the area, the more effective that disinfectant will be in killing off the bacteria and the virus. So I just like to focus on maybe some interesting or unique types of environments that we all might run into. I know everyone has different businesses. We work oftentimes in the school market and uh, with community colleges. So a lot of these will be examples like that, but translate it into your world and your business and how it applies. Um, but things to think about, if you have a locker room, if you own a gym, 
Um, remember, this is going to be a higher moisture area, so you might need to disinfect more frequently than you would, say, in just an auditorium or a meeting space. If you, uh, the nice thing about a locker room or a shower facility is that it's all hard surface. So you're not too concerned about the disinfectant chemistry. You probably won't have to swap out different types of equipment to disinfect the space. You can just come in. Honestly, you could probably even just pressure wash with soap and water and then decide whether or not you wanna do a disinfectant coating um, in, in an environment such as this. So pretty easy. Pools is probably something that not too many of us think about, but I like to point it out because obviously the chemistries inside of the pool are designed to kill off and eradicate the virus and bacteria that live. But what happens with the surface as we get in and out? What about our furniture surrounding the pool, our tables, our loungers, the hand railings going in and out of the pool? That's not getting the same chemistries. So if you have a community center um, or if you're, um, if you're a property manager and you have a community pool, just think about adding to your protocols um, obviously, the social distancing and monitoring how many people are there at one time, maybe with a sign up system is great, but then also have your staff go through and do a wipe down. Maybe when you have take a break or when it's lap period where most of the people are out of the pool, make that a portion of your disinfectant reg regimen and hit all those high touch areas. Weight rooms. I always like to point this out, um, and that's because this is a really big mishmash of a lot of different types of surfaces. We have upholstery, we have leather, we have electronics, and we have a lot of ferrous metals um, and rubberized flooring. So usually the flooring is the least difficult to manage. It's usually the electronics. So if you ever have any questions about the electronics that are in your space, if you remember or know who you purchased them from, typically speaking, the manufacturer can answer questions as to which disinfectants from the CDC guidelines uh, are okay to use on their machinery electronics area. And even if whatever they tell you in terms of the electronics i always say um, take it with a grain of salt when it comes to the rest of the equipment in terms of the seat the bars the weights um, any high touch points you know we have those little keys that we change depending on the weight ratio that we want to use on the equipment that kind of stuff is a little hardier than the electronic screen that we push to get started so you might have to have a dual situation in this type of an environment to make sure you're disinfecting everything properly. And then we kind of already touched on things like dojos or uh, martial arts or wrestling rooms. Those mats can pretty much take a beating. Um, we haven't so far to this point had any issue. We've used quite a few different types of disinfectants because different schools have their own chemistries they prefer to be used that they've gotten approved by their district. And so far, so good. Um, just once again, that foam applicator for those vertical surfaces, if they're uh, soft and kind of get touched a lot, something to think about for that dwell time. So gymnasiums I bring up because natural wood, you know, we're, we're all accustomed to the commercial resiliency floors, but what about some of our old mom and pop restaurants that have age old wood flooring um, that's been stained and resealed a few times. What does it look like to try and disinfect that where you, you don't want to cause moisture damage to that type of a surface? And I would say the electric static sprayer would be a great option for that type of an application because the droplets are so fine you can disinfect a much better surface area with a lot less product being used, which not only saves you money and time, but it also helps protect your surface from getting excess moisture damage. So a, a natural wood surface, I would recommend something along those lines. So then diving into Citrus College, as um, Fred had mentioned, and Fred, feel free to jump in if there's anything you wanna talk about, 
but I like using his um, example because as you'll see, our team came in and they, they not only cleaned surfaces and tried to remove any type of um, debris that was there prior to the disinfecting, but what you can't tell from these pictures is that they are being systematic in each area that they enter and exit. So the ideal situation is that if you're disinfecting a building, you wanna have a single point of entry and a different point of exit. Because just like when you mop your floor at home, you wanna start in the furthest corner and work your way backward so that you're walking your way out of the room or out of the building as you go. So you're not contaminating or recontaminating the surface that you just disinfected. It's the same thing. If you're gonna um, have your own staff do disinfecting in your facility or your business, it's just keep in mind that you need to be systematic, start from one end and work your way oppositely through so that everyone leaves at the same time and doesn't cross back over an already disinfected threshold. And then I'm gonna brag about Fred for a minute because he had the foresight to think, okay, well, we've handled our building, but do I know for sure which fleet vehicle my team member may have come into contact with or may have utilized on that day that they were on campus while positive and not knowing it. So he had his entire fleet also disinfected. So not only was the building and the office spaces disinfected, but the entire set of fleet vehicles, which is a very easy thing to forget. So if any of you have trucks that do deliveries and you have a great um, protocol that happens at your manufacturing plant, that's fantastic, but it also has to apply to the delivery trucks as well if they're yours and they're in your constant um, system and routine. Just something to consider that was really brilliant. So good job, Fred. So then going into our proactive protocols. So I'm going to talk about what we do at Kaya because I don't want to tell anyone what they should or shouldn't do. I just wanna share what we choose to do. And so far it's been effective. We've had two team members test positive for COVID-19 and it has not spread to a single other member. Completely separate instances, both um, came down with COVID-19 from their personal lives and it was uh, traced back to exposure from a family member, in one case a kid, and in another a roommate. Um, but fortunately, nothing spread, and everyone else at our company has been tested a few times since. And we, so our protocols must have been working. So obviously, we know about the social distancing. Um, the sign that you see on the left, thank you for helping to keep our community safe, is just some of our signage we have throughout our entire headquarters campus. It's the first thing you'll see when you go to walk through our door. We have uh, multiple hand sanitizing stations available pretty much at every threshold. Um, that's a major thoroughfare. So anytime you shift from a hallway into one of our departments, there is a sanitation, a hand sanitizer station um, so that as you touch those key, key points, door handles, et cetera, you can make sure trying to minimize the spread of anything. Every break room has its own sanitizing station with hand sanitizer and wipes. We feel very fortunate that we don't have students on our um, campus because we can have Clorox wipes and, and regular uh, sanitary wipes that you have to be careful with. I know through the, the K-12 system, they're very specific about what types of disinfectants students and children can have um, exposure and access to. But then once you utilize our stickers of social distancing, you'll step up and next to our um, desk where our receptionist will greet you, and I'll show you in a minute that we actually have some plexi put up, but this object to the right is a bolide uh, thermal scanner. It will uh, take your temperature in about 1.3 seconds, which is significantly faster than using a handheld 
um, forehead temperature gauge and it also allows you to maintain legitimate social distancing where we're not coming into contact um, you know within that three feet to six feet ratio in terms of distance and the other cool thing about it is that if your manufacturing plant or your company has a security key card access these will actually integrate with your security system so your um, employees can scan their key cards like they normally would at this station it'll take their temperature and if their temperature is not where it needs to be it'll actually lock them out so they will not be able to get through your security doors like they would normally with their key card so it logs their identity just like you would in your normal security system but then if their temperature is too high um, it will lock them out and it'll send whoever the base user is for your security system, it'll send them a notification saying, hey, so-and-so is at the entrance E2 and um, they have been locked out due to temperature, et cetera. So we don't have that. We're not that fancy. Um, we don't manufacture anything that anyone wants to steal. <laughs> So we just have it as a standard thermal scanner, which also works great. And it can house up to 20,000. So if you have 20,000 employees or less on your system, then um, this thermal scanner will work for you. Some other options of thermal scanners that we've seen in the marketplace are, um, they're kind of considered a tunnel thermal scanner. They can maintain readings up to 30 people at a time. So it's, it's kind of what airports have been introducing or I'm sure it's what Disneyland will start introducing if they haven't already as they open back up. So 30 people at a time, this thermal reader can uh, pinpoint each one. And it also has multi-sequenced cameras that you set up as well. So if it pinpoints anybody that is above the temperature they should be, it'll snap a picture of them and alert security as to that person so that they can be um, escorted to a quarantine area um, or requested to leave the premises, whatever your protocols dictate, which is pretty cool. So then in terms of physical blockage, um, for us at our first point of entry at our uh, front desk, we do have plexiglass up. This to the left is actually an example of a frame with plastic film on it. It's slightly less expensive than dealing with plexiglass, this one is just held on uh, with little Velcro dots. If you can see in the different four corners, this is just aluminum because the plastic sheeting is so lightweight that it doesn't put any strain on the framing. And then this is completely mobile. It's not attached in any way to the surface and can be utilized multiple times. Um, it can be wiped down. If you had a protocol that needed to be really sensitive, technically speaking with this type of a solution, your team members could have their own piece of film that is theirs. They take it home with them when they go, they bring it back, they wipe it down and disinfect it. Nobody else touches it. Maybe it lives in their cubby or whatever your situation is, but if you need to be really strict, this would be an easy solution to have each person have their own physical block that only gets um, touched by themselves and not a shared, a shared environment so this is our reception desk you can barely see the plexiglass but we have a block right here and a block right here and the top one has a slit underneath so that papers and any signatures can be passed through and handled um, once again paper does not transfer covid well so that is the good news although use your own pen because the pens and the plastic will but for us, you come through the doors with the signage on it. You stand at the circle until Shane, our receptionist, welcomes you and asks you to step forward. And then he's happy to help you and either call down whoever you're meeting with, make sure that your temperature has been taken and logged on our list. Anyone that comes on campus, we have an employee list that gets um, dictated every day to make sure all of us are taking our temperatures and we're all normal. Any guests that come onto campus, we also add them. We have a, a blank addition page that will write in their name, contact info, and what temperature they were at. And that's just to also help us with tracing. Heaven forbid we had another um, 
exposure where one of our team members tested positive, we would want to be able to inform any guests that had been on site that they could have come into contact with COVID-19. And then I just wanted to share some, some resources. A few are school related, but as we all dive into this unique situation, um, trying to figure out what our own internal protocols look like, there's some really great examples, especially by the schools because they're held to such a high standard. Um, the National Council on School Facilities has some great protocol standards and examples. Um, the NFHS guidance for opening up high school athletics and activities might be a great reference point if you do any type of community interface, uh, if you're Parks and Rec or if you're a community center um, or philanthropy, if you're a nonprofit, that might be a really good resource guide. And then, of course, um, I always like to point out the list and disinfectant tool. This is on the um, CDC website. They do have a click through to it. So rather than having to scroll through their PDF of a million pages of, you know, 464 disinfectants or whatever the list is at now, it's constantly growing. This is a tool that if you go into it, you can kind of um, put in the parameters of what you're looking for. What type of disinfectant are you interested in? Or what do you need it to do? Do you need it to be COVID specific? Are you having a lot of problems with mold and mildew as well? Are you concerned about toxicity to animals? If, if you're an animal rescue, that kind of thing. So you can kind of put in some of um, the specifics and it'll give you a itemized list of some suggestions that fit your parameters, which is a lot easier than trying to pretend that any of us know what any of the differences are between the disinfectants on that list. I've looked at it a million times and I still have no idea. <laughs> so I use the tool all the time. Uh, and then um, San Francisco did a pretty great environment summary um, on alternate disinfecting products. So those are that, you know, that 20 something percentile of the customized disinfectants that are not considered commodity. They did a bunch of testing um, and kind of have a cross comparison of what worked and how it worked on what different types of situations, environments, and surfaces, which is pretty great. And I do know um, I'm keeping an eye out because Long Beach Unified School District, which is one of the largest in the state of California, is doing a comparison of a couple different types of the disruptive coatings that we discussed, where you saw those um, covalent bond carbon spheres disrupting and rupturing the membrane of the virus cell. They have a couple different manufacturers that they're testing against each other on their school site over the course of the next year. So I would love to report back as soon as they have some of their third party testing findings over that time period. I, I'm excited to share with the masses what, what they find out and how accurate the claims are in terms of longevity for that kill ratio to still apply and, and be happening and be functioning. So. And that's, that's about it. I know we covered a lot. It's a bit of a brain scramble, but I would love if anyone has any questions, if there's any aspects you'd like me to go over further, I'm happy to. Well, Lynn, you did an absolutely incredible job. I didn't expect anything less than that. And what a, uh, a wealth of information you've given. And I know that this presentation is going to be a valuable tool when other folks, you know, you can't remember everything. So it's going to be a resource that all of us can go to. Um, one of the things that I did want to say, just to get a point of reference, um, for an educational facility, as Lynn said, we use the electrostatic sprayers. And just as a point of reference, they're about $5,000 a piece. And for my group, I purchased three of them, probably be purchasing some more. And that's, again, predicated on the uh, how many people we bring on campus at a time. Right now, it's a minimum group. Um, the bottom line, whatever county you're within, the county protocols are the ones that you're supposed to follow. The cleaning stuff is constant across the board, but depending on what the level of uh, the testing ratio is in each county, every every county is different. So 
My campus is in LA County. It's one of the more severe ones still. So give you a point of reference on that one. I've had two cases that tested positive. Um, I've got 60 students that just came on board for this semester in the uh, uh, registered nursing program. If I have three test positives in a 14 day period, I have to shut down the entire program. Mm -hmm. So the cleaning process and all of those protocols need to be adhered to because that's your first line of defense that you have for, um, you know, for the group of people that you serve. If it's a small business, you can get away with the little spray bottles and cleaning like that and disinfecting. For anything that's more complicated than that, um, for instance, with the group that we just brought on campus, only one student is a t at a time is allowed to use the restroom. Um, the restrooms are sanitized three times a day. They're only allowed to set two people at a table and obviously they're more than six feet apart. As soon as the break is done, everything that they touched is sanitized again. Thereby, it's ready for the next time that they come out. So we're very, very strict about what we do. But when you think about it, if we had everybody on campus, you're talking about 10,000 people at one time. So that's a huge group. And as Lynn talked about, the uh, contact tracing is going to be the next biggest thing that everybody's going to have to hurdle over. And that very thing is one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons why a lot of folks have not brought a whole lot of people back at the same time, because they're still working on how are we going to attack that? You know, you have a thousand people coming in and how do you know exactly where they went? Who were they next to? The amount of paperwork that's involved in that is astronomical. So like my campus, as well as others, we're still trying to figure out how we're going to attack that problem. But I don't want to keep on talking. Lynn, you did a great job. We really appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. I actually, if you don't mind, I want to jump in just on one comment on the contact tracing. Um, I do know that some of the standard in terms of um, who you need to report contact with is considered anyone that you have been within six feet of for a 10 minute period. So if wow. it's less than 10 minutes, they're saying technically you don't have, it's not required that you list them on your contact list if you yourself test positive. But anyone that was 10 minutes or longer, then you're gonna need to include them on that contact list to be um, informed. Awesome. Yeah. Lynn, I have a question, uh, just a real quick one. Um, this is Peg. Hi, everybody. Thanks Hi. for sitting. Hi, Dave. Okay, so I purchased and am using a clear face shield. And the reason I am using a face shield instead of a face mask is that I still am called out to do job walks. I mean, there are in my in our industry here, amazingly, um, construction is still going on at, at a lot bigger rate, at least in it just in my own book of business. And um, it just seems to me that I would want my customers to be able to see my face, especially if I'm meeting people for the same time. Uh, it's just a much better impression. There's more trust. They could read me better. It's just my only personal opinion that sure. it would make them feel comfortable if they could see my face. Um, however, it, in your opinion, am I still being responsible and, you know, keeping them safe as well as me, you know, wearing this face shield? Because the bottom part of the shield, even though it covers my entire head, not top, but nose, mouth, all the way, you know, a little bit past my chin, it's still open at the bottom there. Could you comment on that? Sure, absolutely. I would say it depends on the situation that you're in. So if you're um, just greeting and interfacing with clients and customers and you're still maintaining that six foot distance approximately, yeah. Um, yeah. then that I don't foresee that being an issue personally. But for example, if you're going to be in a conference room where you know that that bottom open portion of your face shield is going to be above something else that someone else could come into contact with, if it's mm -hmm. a desk surface or mm -hmm. a conference table or maybe even the chair, um, mm -hmm. 
that you're in, it's just something to, to be aware of and think about. So then maybe when you go to leave that area, just give it a disinfectant wipe. Grab a wipe, wipe it down, just like you would at the gym to make sure that you're not leaving anything behind when you get up and move on. That is a, I never thought of that. Okay, another really quick question, if you don't mind, since I have you and you've got this kind of wealth knowledge. So Absolutely. that's a good point for my wearing my face shield. Um, mm -hmm. I, I wanna put it back a little bit more, I guess, and ask another for a personal protocol, just because I have come into contact with a variety of customers and uh, not just customers, but colleagues, because we have weekly COVID calls. Now they're twice, now they're every bi-weekly, thank God. But there's a whole range. There are people that are not concerned about this at all. I mean, really, they're not concerned. They, they really think that uh, it's, it's a, a disease that you are at risk with only if you're much more elderly and mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, Anyway, their reaction is on one side of the scale. And then I have people, and I again, I want to keep my customers and my colleagues top of top of mind on the other side that just believe that, uh, you know, people that have this, even if they're young and they get it, they get, they come back from the hospital with irreparable um, organ damage. And, you know, they're very, very, very fearful. So I know you're not a medical professional, but you are in the field and have access to records. Could you give me a better, uh, you know, a better idea where in this in this realm? I know people's reactions are different, but you know where. I guess I just want to find. I want to. I want uh, someone to help me put myself where in this where in the spectrum should I be? You know, as a responsible person who still has to function in the world. Sure, of course, yeah. So what we do at Kaya is we kind of take the lead of the client who we're interfacing with um, because we never want to be perceived as instilling our own personal opinions on anyone else. We're much more interested in where they lie on that spectrum. So our rule of thumb is just trying to make everyone as comfortable as possible and as safe as possible no matter which side of the spectrum they land on. So for example, if we had a client show up for a campus tour who really doesn't believe in any of this stuff and the second they walk through their through our door, they wanna take their mask off because they did their due diligence externally and they think, oh, no one's gonna see me inside the building. I would just very you know, nicely um, inform them that we all wear our masks when we're moving from place to place. But once we sit down in our meeting room and we're appropriately socially distanced, they're more than welcome to take their mask off um, since we're at a safe distance as they're more comfortable. And, you know, I would allow them to feel more, feel more comfortable of, oh, I know they're so hard to breathe through or something relatable to their own personal opinion that is obviously being conveyed while still encouraging them to follow our protocols and follow our rules but not getting upset with them or emotional about where they fall on the spectrum. Um, mm -hmm. Just kind of being respectful of what their thoughts are and that's okay, everyone's entitled to their opinion. It's just my job to try and keep my team members safe and them safe as well, while being sympathetic to what their, their personal opinions are. And then of course, when we're done with the meeting, if they forget to put their mask on as they go to leave that meeting room, I'll just gently remind them that, you know, I'd love to walk them out to their car and if they wouldn't mind sliding their mask back on, could I get them a water, things like that. Try and directly encourage following of the rule and then quickly turning to a topic that's not so emotionally charged maybe for them. Um, and then also on the opposite side of the spectrum, for those that are fearful, we want to make sure that if someone is leaving their house for the first time and coming to our campus, that they can see all the efforts we're going through to make them safe. And so if I can tell that someone is really nervous to be in a space that isn't their home and their controlled environment, I might let them know about some of our protocols, that we have our cleaning crew every evening that does deep disinfecting 
And then our day porter goes around and every morning um, does all the touch point disinfecting as well. Since about 11 to noon is kind of halfway through our day, we start pretty early since we're in construction. And um, she disinfects all the handrails, all the doorknobs, that kind of stuff, just to try and give them something to feel a little more comfortable. So I think you just kind of have to read your audience and try and be a chameleon while still following the safety protocols that you guys have decided are what you're going to abide by as, mm -hmm. as a company. Mm -hmm. Thank I you. <laughs> Good. Does anyone else have any questions or, or any um, success stories they want to share? I know we have a lot of different industries in this group, so I would love to hear if anyone has had some great successes with a specific type of protocol or schedule. Well, Lynn, I'll tell you, uh, the, one, the folks that we'd have uh, test positive on our campus, thank huh? goodness there were absolutely no symptoms at all. And after oh. the... 14 day incubation period, um, another testing, and then they were allowed to come back to work. So that was all good. That's fantastic. Yeah, we, we had a little bit, <laughs> we kind of panicked a little bit after our first um, positive test. So we actually brought in a company and we tested our entire staff. Every single person got a test just because it was the first time we were dealing with a potential exposure. And we just wanted everyone to feel taken care of and to know um, off the bat what we're dealing with. So, but we haven't done that since. Our, our second one, we handled a little bit more with grace and ease. <laughs> Didn't panic quite as much. And, and we just our new normal. And, That's right. Uh, yep, did the contract tracing. Anyone that was within that realm of 10 minutes or more got sent home and um, requested to incubate for the time period and then get two negative tests before coming back to work so peg i think that probably is a good answer to one of your questions you may not have bad uh, you may or may not have any medical disabilities from it but think about this if you no longer go to work or you just now took out two or three key members of your team because you're of this contact tracing, you've met, you've made a major impact to your company. So uh, maybe you can't get the people to to think this is serious on a health issue, but I know on my my team, if I lost more than one or two people, that would not be a good idea. Uh, so maybe that's something you could consider when you're talking to those less uh, proactive people in your office. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Well, and I do have to say that our leaders, um, our executive team, our CEO, they've been really great champions of norms and expectations. So they're the first ones to be really good about the second they stand up from their desk, they're putting their mask on, they're walking the halls with their mask on. So they're the first ones.